Rupert better fed, better equipped, faster, bigger, and stronger than athletes of any other era. But more colorful? Well, there are a few interesting characters playing right now, but I think the most interesting personalities played in the 1950s. It was only a 12-team league in those days, and the average salary uh, was about $7,500 a year. Everyone knew everybody else, and rivalries were fought fiercely and frequently. And such an environment fostered great teams and exciting players. Some fun-loving guys, others not very nice at all. But this uh, spicy combination made up a period in sports history that is regarded as the golden age of pro football. The fabulous 50s, the Eisenhower years. A period when people took life and each other a little less serious. A decade where the vision of America was tinted with optimism. Nowhere was this image clearer than in pro football. It was heroic, romantic, and nostalgic. The purest form of sport. Pro football became the new national obsession and burst into full flower in the 50s. For nostalgia buffs, the 50s meant fire wagon football, a merry-go-round of big plays, a circus of carefree and colorful performance. It was filled with magic moments and magical players. One half of pro football's all-time team played in this decade. Pro football in the 50s was not stylized or synchronized but a wild game. A highlight film with all the penalties and mistakes left in. At the top, pro football bubbled like soda pop, effervescent and sweet. But beneath the surface, the game had a harsh, bitter taste. It was a rough, violent, often brutal sport. And you get into that sort of a cannibalistic feeling. All you want to do is go out there and, like I say, you just want to kill somebody. I want to get him, I'm going to kill him. Not mean you are, you're going to put him in the ground after, but you just want to kill a guy, boy. You, you, you actually fall from the mouth and you're going to really put it to him. In the 50s, the meek did not inherit this turf. There were bitter rivalries between teams and fierce grudges between players. One that festered for years concerned the Rams Deacon Dan Tower and the Colts Art Donald. I said, let's get Deacon Dan. That was our time. He said, fine. So here comes the, the Rams out of huddle. Van Brocken was a quarterback. He hands fake hand off to Deacon Dan. He comes into the line. They pissed the ball out to a halfback. And Finn and I got Deacon Dan down on the ground. We were really going at him. So the official grabs us. He said, if you guys do that again, it's going to cost you 100 bucks. I'm going to throw you out of the game. We didn't know that Deacon Dan, he ran off the field. And they put the other fullback in named Tank Younger. And they both look alike. Uh, they were six foot three, 240 pounds. They're both black, so unless you knew the number, you didn't know who the hell they were. Same play again. We got him down on the ground. Now, I got his nose. I'm trying to pull his nose off his face and finish, finish banging on the back of the neck. So all of a sudden, from underneath the pile comes, hey, he says, leave me go. He says, this ain't the deke. It's the tank. We had the wrong guy. Players like Art Donovan could find something funny in a broken leg. They were undeniably violent, certifiably tough. I lost six teeth on one play when I blocked the punt. He kicked me in the teeth and uh, knocked all my teeth out. And I vividly remember that because I was looking on the ground for my teeth. And, when I'm, and everyone was yelling, get in the huddle, Bob. You know, it wasn't get off the field, Bob. You know, get in the huddle. We, we, we don't want to call a timeout. Number 79, Bob St. Clair of the 49ers had a caveman aura, but he was no brainless brute. At six foot nine, 270 pounds, he was a massive blocking machine. St. Clair credited his great strength to eating raw meat, an eccentricity which earned him the nickname, the geek. We used to go out and shoot doves, and it was all illegal, you know, in the season and so forth. And, uh, I would, would take uh, the doves, and uh, I remember one day, I had about 12, uh, well, maybe more than that, uh, 12, 15 doves. And we were 
plucking him and cleaning him, and I would take the heart, you know, and I was making a little pile of dove hearts over here in the corner. And then this this uh, kid from Nebraska came Omaha and came over and said, uh, what are you doing with that pile of hearts? And I said, why, well, I'm going to eat them. That's why I put them over there. And he said, what well, are you going to have make some kind of a sauce? I said, sauce? No, 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 these are real good this way here. You see these? And I, I put two in my mouth and was chewing on them and looking at them. And I thought he, was, he turned three different colors. I thought he was going to faint right there. He ran out of there. I'm sure that he would call back to his girlfriend or his wife or his mother or something in, in Omaha and say, there are cannibals out here. The 1950s produced the most outlandish cast of characters in pro football history a witch's brew of monsters, mavericks, and magicians. The most colorful team in the league was the Detroit Lions, a riotous bunch of revelers who loved wine, women, and song. Their party shaper was quarterback Bobby Lay. One time we passed him at halftime, coming out for the second half in Baltimore. I said, Bobby, how you doing? He breathed on me. I said, Jesus, is that from last night? He said, I had a couple at halftime. Well, you know, he was a character, but a great football player, tough guy. This blonde, slightly pudgy Texan played football and lived life in flamboyant style. In a city of working men, number 22 was a workmanlike quarterback who appeared to do nothing right except win. I did do some things that uh, I do regret now. Uh, I did, uh, I, as I always said, I went in the front door. I didn't sneak <laughs> in the back door. It hurt my family some. That's the only thing. The publicity. Everybody knew me in Detroit, and I couldn't go anywhere without some conversation. A teammate once said, when Bobby said block, you blocked. When he said drink, you drank. Lane and the Lions typified a sense of adventure, something that transcends statistics, a flair that endures in the memory. Hit him, hit him, care. play without a face mask, and then you really went after him. Three of us hit him at one time, and they all holler, watch out, Bobby, here they come. And when he got him back in the offensive huddle, he kicked two of them, he kicked Creekman right in the legs. He was so mad at Creekman for missing Marchetti, he, he kicked him right in the shins. Creekman stood there and took it. Bobby was hot-headed and explosive. He played full tilt every moment and expected his teammates to do the same. Under his whip, the Lions won four Western Conference titles, two NFL championships, and became more important to Detroit than General Motors. While the Lions were consistently of championship caliber, other teams also shaped the history of the 50s. The Los Angeles Rams dominated the early years with a glamorous team that possessed more skilled players than any team of the decade. The Rams rang up points like a pinball machine, and the results of their games read like old-time basketball scores. In 1956, George Hallis's Chicago Bears were primed to win a title with their bruising style of play. But 1956 belonged to number 42 quarterback Charlie Connolly, who passed the New York Giants to an NFL championship. All across the 50s stretched the shadow of the most dominant team, the Cleveland Browns. In 10 years, the dynasty created by Paul Brown captured seven Eastern Conference crowns and three NFL championships. While the Browns were a model of excellence, a history of failure had marked the Baltimore Colts. The 50s Colts were victims of bad breeding sired by the sad sack Colts of the late 40s and the dreadful Dallas Texans of 1952, these Colts were a bad seed. 
They were a collection of oddballs, a team with little character, but many characters. Don Cole, Sister Laverna, Y.A. Till, and myself, we were roommates. So we had a big shower in this big bathroom, and we locked the shower stall door, and we filled up the shower all the way up for maybe about six foot. And we went over the top from the glass, and within the four of us are in there. We were all, you know, bear, uh, swimming around, having a good time. And somebody hit the latch, and the damn door opens up, and maybe 100 gallons of water goes all over our floor and down the next apartment house, and the ceiling caved in. And you know how to pay for it. Tittle, we didn't have any money. And he was the only guy making any money, and from that day, he would never speak to us, really. He was tied in a clan with Lodgejaw. Head coach Weeb Eubank rebuilt this laughing stock of a team by drafting sure shots or taking chances on obscure college plays. Tackling fullback Alan Amici number 35 proved harder than knocking a tank off its tracks. And there was no defense against the acrobatics of Raymond Barrett. The Pony Express began to roll in earnest when a racehorse named Lenny Moore became their number one draft choice. Wild number 24 added a new dimension to the offense. It was another eager rookie that made the dramatic difference. Johnny Unites transformed himself from a $6 a day sandlot player into an NFL quarterback and transformed the Colts from chumps into champions. We had a football team that, you know, laughed together, played together, uh, lived together, liked each other. It was a rare combination of personalities and talents, and uh, I think the Colt team in those years was the best place in the world to be. Great ownership, great leadership, and great players. Baltimore won an NFL championship in 1958, and again in 1959 when they defeated the New York Giants. This marvelous team, which included seven Hall of Fame members, crushed the Giants 31 to 16 to close out the decade. By the turn of the decade, pro football became part of the American culture, and the fabulous 50s will be remembered fondly for those monsters, mavericks, and magicians who played their sport with abandon, with delight, and with a touch of class.